the end. Um, it looks like we're recording. Right, I'll go to go, Jonathan. Okay, so yeah, uh, why don't we get started? So I'm happy to introduce Renan Tamari, um, who uh, did his PhD at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, um, focused on grounded language understanding, and looks like more recently he's been getting interested in collective sense making, which I'm really interested in. Um, he also interned twice at AI2, um, once on LNLP and once on Aristo. So I think we're quite familiar with him. Um, and uh, take it away. Cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, I was just telling Brennan that I was fortunate to be like the last intern before COVID in 2019. So I was on site in Seattle. <laughs> uh, but yeah, good to be here again, even virtually and uh, looking forward to sharing my research with you. Um, so this talk will be um, about both my PhD as well as sort of the uh, newer directions that uh, you mentioned, Jonathan. Um, and yeah, environment-oriented modeling for grounded NLP and collective sense-making systems. I think the kind of th theme, the thread that's been running through uh, both my th PhD as well as like uh, more recent interests, uh, inspirations from ecological cognition. The TLDR of that is kind of this, this quote, uh, by William Mace, ask not what's inside your head, but what's your head inside of. Uh, and it was a reaction to classical cognitive science or neuroscience focused on studying brains in isolation and with little account of the role of embodiment and environments in shaping cognition. So my PhD kind of uh, took that sort of idea and then asked it in, in, in these other like more updated contexts of grounded NLP research, later AI augmented sense making, and, and then uh, the third part of the talk, so each of those is going to be a part, and then the third part I'll, I'll talk about some directions I'm thinking about for a semantic scholar. So yeah, part one is um, focused on, on the sort of NLP research that was the main, main sort of uh, part of my PhD. Um, and yeah, so here you could kind of switch that sentence and ask not what's inside your model, but what your model is inside of. Uh, you know, by modeling, um, kind of in NLP, we talk about creation, training, and deployment of machine learning models that perform tasks on natural language data. And this word that I invented for the purpose of the talk, environing, is kind of like environment-oriented modeling, designing, creating, deploying environments for data collection and generation, as well as training and evaluation of NLP models. So really kind of treating environments as first-class uh, research citizens. Uh, and just to kind of show where this fits in, you know, because uh, like the mainstream, I think a lot of the research is it tends to focus on sort of the modeling side where you're developing new architectures or new optimization methods, um, or on the data side where you're collecting a new data set or, or collecting some annotations. Scaling experiments of data or parameters could be kind of somewhere in the middle. But this kind of asking the question of where does the data come from, it leads to this uh, question of environments. Um, and we have things like interactive environments, such as AI2 Thor, these kind of embodied uh, 3D simulators or 2D simulators where agents are actually like directly interacting with an environment. And then there's annotation environments, which are actually quite similar, where you have an annotator or annotators that are uh, working with some interface and then uh, recording sort of the actions, and that's becoming a data set. So if you're thinking about this in kind of RL term, like reinforcement learning, this is interaction environments are kind of like a, this online um online environment and then offline environment annotation environments are kind of this offline environment where uh the annotated data you can think of as some kind of recording of agent and environment interactions that are later used to train uh, models so uh yeah probably i'm going to be saying environment a lot so I'll, I'll say a few more words about what i mean by environment um so kind of you know broadly it's this interaction space the real virtual world in which agents operate and at the computational core, uh, I'm thinking of this as the uh, transition function for Markov decision processes. So, you know, if we're thinking about the, again, the reinforcement learning formulation, we have an agent. Uh, we think of that as like a policy. It's getting sort of the world state and then it's outputting some action. And the environment is everything else. It's like what's surrounding the agent. So the, agent, the environment gets the uh, action and it keeps track of the state and then updates the new state. So it's really just the sort of uh, interaction, what the agent is interacting with. Uh, the API kind of that the agent is uh, is working on. A kind of you know example of I think where this sort of environment oriented modeling is is really uh, coming through these days. Uh, if you're looking sort of at the contemporary kind of research, uh, we see it happening in in RLHF, reinforcement learning from human feedback that's been used in models like uh, ChatGPT and similar. Um, and here is this uh, tweet kind of summarizes 
the idea is that researchers are collecting, uh, they're, they're creating some kind of environment for humans and agents to interact in, and then they're uh, using that to enable some kind of large scale rapid collection of interaction data. So there's really this kind of from the ground up thinking about this environment, um, which is then sort of shaping the types of interactions collected, which is then shaping the resulting model. So we'll see this kind of triangle, and I'll be going back to it like uh, in the course of all the different uh, uh, projects I've worked on, and, and we'll see kind of how it manifests itself. So yeah, so in the first part, I'll be talking about uh, some uh, new training and annotation environments I worked on in, uh, for procedural text. And I'll talk about Dynababy, which is a synthetic data engine, uh, which we use for model probing. And yeah, and then that'll lead to some uh, more modeling as well as some other research directions. So the first part is uh, text-based gain environments for procedural text understanding. And this, the context of this, this is also an internship in, in AI2. And the, the objective is um, lab protocols. So you want to be able to extract structured representations from natural language texts uh, describing procedures. And to date, methods have mostly focused on text mining applications. But the question that I kind of asked in this uh, work was, is that what we actually want or just a limit of available annotations? And there was reason to think that, that we might want more because um, this kind of new frontier is, is kind of developing where you have actually uh, text to robot sort of uh, uh, experiments and, and ideas coming forward where you actually want to be able to um, build, um, you want to actually be able to execute protocols using machine executable code. And then you want to be able to convert uh, protocols from the literature, just like natural language protocols, uh, to this kind of machine executable code for later uh, execution on, on cloud laboratories. So uh, looking at this step actually is not really possible in the current available methods uh, and no current you know, data really supports it. So that was the focus of this, uh, this project. And looking at sort of the existing annotation methods that people use for these kind of uh, uh, procedural text tasks, uh, the meaning representation is something called action graphs. Um, you can see here an example uh, below. And it's mainly meant for sentence level uh, annotation. So it lacks a lot of essential details if you want to actually you know, turn this into code. Um, and the annotation tool that is used to create these is also not sufficient. So it's not like you could just invent a new mini representation and then use the existing annotation tools. You kind of have to rethink both of them at once. Uh, people use this tool called uh, RAP, which probably many of you are familiar with. Um, but it's not really designed either for process level uh, representation. It's, again, more for kind of sentence level annotations. So what we did here was really kind of rethink the whole environment stack. And, and we use text-based games as an environment, uh, both for the training and annotation. And text-based games are, are uh, really useful here because they provide this kind of friendly environment with uh, richer structure and feedback. So you know, you're know, you trying to do something that's illegal in the environment, like uh, grinding some material that's in a liquid state, and you get, the inform in, you get an informative message from the console. You can't do that, which is helpful both for annotators as well as for uh, learning agents. This little animated GIF shows sort of the, uh, how, how the sort of schematically how the process works. The wet lab protocol here is the actual natural language test text uh, so the annotator or the agent is seeing this. The command consoles where they're entering uh, commands, which actually create this uh, uh, new meaning representation, which we call the process execution graph. And this is kind of a process level representation you can see here. Uh, it's not just sentence level, it kind of uh, spans the whole uh, process. So the first um, work was just a workshop paper. This was kind of before we even had annotated text. We had just the text lab game engine. Uh, we used it to create uh, synthetic data. So this was just kind of a sanity check to see that the environment worked. We took a sort of vanilla reinforcement learning agent uh, and applied it to these kind of syn synthetic uh, procedures that we generated here. This is just kind of an example. You're taking a few materials, you're doing a few operations on them. Um, and yeah, and we, we, we applied this agent. We could see, not surprisingly, that it kind of was able to do this sort of simple uh, procedures and then it got stuck on longer ones. Um, and the nice thing about these environments also is that they enforce uh, validity on the resulting output. So that the, whatever the agent outputs is going to be a valid procedure just because it's working online with the sort of text-based game environment, which is not letting it do illegal stuff. But we wanted to do uh, see if we could actually apply this to real-world text. So um, the, the main project here was um, what we called executable wet labs protocols. And we used the text lab environment to enrich an existing data set uh, to an executable format. So, uh, we took this sentence level an annotations and we used the uh, text-based game framework to uh, make it executable. So annotators um, 
worked, as I showed you there in that animation, um, and they created these graphs that you can see here. And we saw that text-based game framework improved both annotation quality and quantity. So quality by ensuring this kind of validity, uh, required arguments, things like that. Um, and quantity, just because uh, when you're working with a text-based game, you can do a lot of estate keeping and maintain a lot more details than you could do if you were actually manually had to add every single relation. So those are just some examples of these uh, annotations we gathered, uh, <coughs> the process level sort of representation. For um, on the modeling side, what we did with these, uh, we tried to actually uh, directly predict the process graph uh, using uh, uh, EYGIE method, uh, for which was actually developed sort of at the same time, and it was it was exactly for this kind of entity relation event uh, framework. What we saw here was that the local relations were a lot easier to predict than cross sentence relations, which isn't really surprising, but but it's still I think something worth noting because um, I think it's an example of something that, that I encountered a few times. Where you have a new annotation method, you often capture new kinds of information, which lead to new modeling challenges. So the DYGIE was developed for data sets where it typically like there was sentence level and, and not so many long-term relations. Uh, so we can kind of uh, challenge the, the, the model, modeling approach with a new data set. Uh, so yeah, that was the first part, sort of part. Um, this talk is actually going to be uh, relatively broad across a lot of different work and not going into a ton of detail in each one of them because uh, I figure you'll ask at the end the things you're interested in. So yeah, feel free also to, this is a good point to maybe stop if you have uh, particular questions about this section. Cool. Uh, so yeah, if not, I'll continue. Um, the second, the second uh, chapter of this first part is uh, probing language models, world models. And this was kind of a look at um, a more theoretical aspect of, of uh, language modeling because um, this question that I encountered during the sort of uh, work on the text-based games, it, it, and I looked at the cognitive science and, and kind of got acquainted with uh, sort of how humans learn language. And there's this idea where humans learn ca these causal world models through embodied interaction with the you know, world, and then they recruit them in the course of language comprehension. But language models only have access to humans' textual observations about the world. So there's this question, you know, language models don't have the same kind of world models humans have. Um, they only have, as you can see here below, this kind of schematic is, is saying they only see the data that humans are um, outputting into the, uh, you know, internet, and they're not uh, able to sort of, you know, gain this kind of causal world model that humans have. And the question is, can language models uh, approximate world models? So this kind of started off a new line of work where we wanted to be able to ask this question and actually probe the, the language models, world models. and Again, you need some kind of environment to do that. Um, nothing existing kind of supplied that uh, uh, requirement. Um, so yeah, we needed a micro world environment for a controllable task generation, and we built it uh, using the popular Babi benchmark, which probably many of you are familiar with. I'll go over it later just uh, in case. The environment here is essentially, again, a, a Python text-based game engine, which simulates uh, simple events involving agents, location, and objects. So exactly this kind of causal world modeling that you want to be able to probe uh, precisely. For example, right, this is just kind of how the uh, the engine, just kind of a, a simplified re representation. You have the story here on the bottom, some kind of sequence of events, and then you have the actual world state at every time step, so you can really probe exactly what details the model uh, knows or doesn't. Uh, another note about Babi was that the this data set has been a long, around for a long time. Uh, we call it Babi 1.0, the original data set, but it's also known to have quality issues already for at least you know a few years back, and yet people keep benchmarking models on the original task. So it's still being used today, actually, uh, which is kind of funny. But I think it really speaks to this point where, where people mostly <laughs> it just kind of gets overlooked a lot of times the environment. And if you look at the code to create baggy tasks, um, it's really not so easy to do that. And, and it's probably that's the reason why people tend to focus on like you know the model side. So what we did here was create a data engine. Uh, so we called it DynaBabby. And it enables more precise control of task composition and difficulty, and that's what we use to create sort of Babi 2.0, um, the newer version of, of Babi. Just kind of quickly to uh, remind people of the structure of, of Babi instances, in case you haven't seen it. Instances in Babi are, are simple. It's just a passage question answer tuple, like you can see here on the right. Sentences correspond to events, so you have things like move, grab, drop, give. And then events get mapped to language using templates and including more complex linguistic constructs. So you'll have things like co-reference and conjunction, compound co-reference. 
Uh, and that's pretty much it. It's, it's really simple. I mean, the language itself is very simple, and, but, and yet you can get kind of complex reasoning chains, which I'll show you in a second, uh, to control sort of the difficulty of the samples we're generating. Um, we looked at two uh, main parameters, and that one was the supporting fact set, this F here, which is simply the sentences necessary to answer a question. So in this case, you need the first three sentences to answer the question, where is Mary? And the support composition we call FC are the event, the union of all the events that appear in the uh, in this uh, supporting fact set. So move, co-reference, and give in this example. And then we can control implicit inference difficulty through uh, controlling the supporting fact size, the set, the size of that set. Uh, so more supporting facts, the more difficult the inference is, um, and novelty through held out composition. So uh, by holding out some of these support compositions, we're actually uh, we can be sure we're sort of uh, evaluating a model and some kind of reasoning pattern that they hadn't seen at training time. Okay, so moving from BABI 1.0 to 2.0, just to kind of give you an example of what this looks like, BABI 1.0 is focused on these different concepts independently. You have things like uh, task two in BABI, which is object tracking. Uh, so um, yeah, where is the some object? And you have co-reference, uh, where is John? And then there's like this co-reference that, that uh, mentioned John. BABI 2.0 features compositions of concepts. So here there's co-reference as well as object tracking. This is something that doesn't appear in the original BABI tasks. So we created train and test tasks for this, um, uh, the first experiment. Essentially, we just concatenated the original BABI tasks. So the concat sets are just concatenating a subset. This is two BABI, set, BABI uh, tasks, seven and 12. There are 20 in total. We, we looked at 12 in this work. And these mixture uh, splits are compositions of the original task. So these are like the, the new ones we generated. So um, just to give you an example of what they look like, this is the mixed T12. It's the hardest evaluations that we created. And you have something like this where it's uh, uh, five supporting facts. And um, yeah, if you try to follow, <laughs> if you try to answer this, you can see it's, it's pretty complicated even for humans. Uh, where is the football? So I have to kind of reason backwards about the football. So Julie has the football and she has the apple. And we know that Apple is in the bedroom because that's where Bill is. Uh, and then I have to kind of piece that all together and, and the football is in the bedroom. So uh, yeah, not easy for humans. And then yeah, can models do this kind of thing? So yeah, the first experiment is training uh, models on BABI 1.0 and testing them on BABI 2.0. We looked at both specialized models as well as uh, general purpose and pre-trained models. So the specialized ones were actually developed specifically for BABI. So they're supposed to be good at relational reasoning and, and state tracking and all that stuff. What we saw here is actually that even with the very simple, uh, the simplest kind of, of mixtures, um, the pre-trained models already far sort of out, outperformed the, uh, the specialized models. And then when we looked at the, the harder tasks, uh, we saw that neither, neither kind of model did really well, meaning that the original tasks are driving compositional learning for any of these models. So the natural next question we looked at was, how does the data, um, can we do something with the data, right? Because the original data doesn't seem to be uh, enough to sort of drive the compositional learning. Maybe we can change the data in some way that would affect uh, performance. So we looked at enriching uh, the data using two strategies. One was adding simply um, more questions to the original tasks. We call that uh, the inject strategy. You can see here on the, on the right, these blue questions. So we're taking the original Babi stories and just adding uh, new questions that weren't asked in the original stories. And diverse is sampling more structurally diverse training data. So this is actually um, uh, throwing away all the original training data and then sampling new data uh, in a way that's more structurally diverse. The thing about the original Babi training data is that it's very formulaic and it's like uh, very low diversity. The stories are always like two sentences and then a question, then another two sentences, then another question. So it's, it's very low diversity. And here we're, we're sampling more diverse data. So in terms of the, um, this experiment, what we could see is that knowledge injection didn't substantially improve compositionality. So just adding new questions to the original stories uh, wasn't doing much. But adding the structurally diverse instances uh, was far more significant in terms of improvements in compositional generalization. Here I'm showing all the results with the T5 model, which was the best model we, we found. Um, yeah, this is also not super surprising. I mean, we see this in executable semantic parsing that diversity, structural diversity is more important than quantity. Um, what is interesting though, is that the, the compositional generalization is still limited. Even, even, you know, even here, as it looks like 84.82 is kind of relatively high. If you actually look at the details, which is what I'll show you in a second, you can actually see that uh, performance is, is pretty uh, poor. So 
This is a plot showing a breakdown of all the questions in the test set, the mixed T12, that's like the hardest uh, test set. Each bucket here, each row is kind of a bucket of all the questions that um, have a certain pattern where uh, the support composition is uh, move and co-reference for this example. That's like, this is like, a, these are Boolean, like a Boolean vector you can imagine here where the uh, V indicates that it's active. So this one here is where you have a move and co-reference as the support composition and two or less supporting facts. Uh, so, and then you're looking at the performance on, on each of these question types. So this time we can kind of look at the performance across the whole uh, training, uh, whole test set. Uh, and these blue frames here uh, indicate which patterns we're seeing at training time. So which support compositions we're seeing at training time. Um, and that's kind of the first thing we can see is that performance is generally high for these, um, these familiar uh, training pat tra patterns seen at training time, seen at training time. And when we're moving towards the novel um, support compositions, as well as like the more supporting facts here, you see n larger than greater equal than four, uh, we can see the performance is like really degraded considerably. And this kind of shows, okay, the model maybe on average is kind of doing, you know, 84% accuracy, but actually like if you're looking at the details, uh, it's not really doing anything systematic. And it's kind of uh, failing on a lot of these new and more complex uh, cases. So, yeah. That was, um, yeah, so that was regarding the second experiment. Um, yeah, and that's the second paper. And yeah, so this, this is the, another good time. If you have any questions about this work, um, I'll pause here for a second. The third work is kind of a uh, sort of natural extension. So, <clears throat> okay. So yeah, in, in, in this work, um, it's kind of, okay, now we have, we have a sort of data engine, DynaBabby, and we have this ability to sort of um, annotate with rich detail, like these um, complicated stories. Now we can use it sort of to develop a new modeling approach. Um, this was, yeah, a breakpoint, breakpoint modeling. Uh, this is from last uh, year, NLP, EM NLP. So the question we started with here was really, can providing more intermediate supervision improve model performance on, on Babby 2.0? And more broadly, can we model these kind of intermediate belief states in transformers? And we thought this would be interesting beyond Bobby 2.0 for represent, representing and reasoning uh, intermediate representations, which is kind of necessary for um, you know, multi-hop questions and things like that. Uh, and we also thought it'd be useful for debugging models and helping interpret their predictions. The inspiration we took as the name uh, hints at is uh, from breakpoints and programming. We kind of tried to, yeah, it, we thought it'd be useful if we could have something like uh, a natural language breakpoint, where after every point in, in a story, you can sort of query the model for this kind of propositional information. Uh, you know, where is a certain entity? Um, anything essentially you can ask in natural language and then just get this kind of uh, true, false, uh, or unknown uh, indication. So the way we implemented it was using uh, what we call breakpoint tokens, which are similar to CLS tokens. Uh, we call them SIT tokens. They're summaries of semantic state up until a specified location. So we treat this token as a summary of the story up until this uh, point, and this one is a summary up until the second sentence, etc. In terms of architecture, um, what we did here was build up, uh, build upon existing like transformer encoders, encode a story, uh, encode a story with these uh, intermediate tokens inserted between each sentence. Uh, then we take the token representation, these green uh, vectors here. On the, sec on the same, using the same uh, method, we encode the propositions um, where each P1, P2, or the, these are the set of the propositions corresponding to the first sentence or the second sentence, et cetera. So we get um, the purple vectors here, which are the encodings of the separate propositions. And then essentially we can score each um, proposition with the corresponding uh, situation token representation, uh, do a three-way classification, and we're getting uh, true, false, and unknown uh, predictions for each of these propositions. <laughs> and yeah, you can you can add this to an existing, uh, you know, the existing loss you train, uh, for example, a QA transformer, generative QA, like a text-to-text -text T5 model. Uh, you can simply add another, uh, train it with another loss, and, and train it to maybe to predict uh, these propositions as well. So we compared this um, with representation learning methods because this was kind of one of the one of the sort of 
uh, one of the things we had in mind here was building a, a representation, sort of a detailed uh, representation for, for these like long uh, narrative texts. So uh, we compared ourselves against sentence transformers, which um, the way we did it is, is uh, again, pretty straightforward. We, we simply take these stories, we add a special token indicating where the breakpoint should be, and the sentence transformer gives us an encoding of this, of this whole story as a vector. We do the same for the proposition. We get the vector encoding of the proposition. Then we can similarly score it to get the uh, three-way classification. Um, the thing to note here is that we're doing key calls to the sentence transformer because we need uh, one for each sort of one where the sentence, one where the breakpoint representation is here, uh, one where it's a, after the second sentence, and then for each of the key uh, breakpoints, we have to encode it separately. So the breakpoint transformer is is doing it in one pass, so it's, it's already kind of more e efficient than this uh, sentence transformer method. The data we compared ourselves uh, on was uh, synthetic, both synthetic and human authored tasks. So looking at uh, Clutter, Babby, and a uh, data set called Trip. I'll talk here about uh, Babby and Trip, which were the focus of my work on this project. Um, yeah, for, for the Babby results, what we saw was basically similar performance to baseline in, in both the IID and compositional settings. Uh, the, this one, hard QA, is kind of a, that's the data from uh, the Babby 2.0 that, that I talked about in the previous section. So we're seeing kind of similar performance to the uh, baseline. So the baseline in the IID, in the proposition prediction setting, the baseline is the sentence transformer. And in the QA setting, it's uh, BART or T5. Um, and yeah, so we saw similar performance. But the I think the plus side is that we can do both of them efficiently and simultaneously. So one model does both the proposition prediction as well as the question answering, whereas you know, if you're doing it with the models uh, you have today, then you have to use, uh, yeah, you have to use two different models essentially. So uh, that was sort of the, the result on, on Babby. Um, and this was kind of, yeah, in, in a sense, we, we kind of hoped uh, to be able to achieve better compositional generalization performance. Um, we didn't get that yet, but what we did sort of see is that we have a, an architecture that can do both sort of this intermediate proposition prediction as well as question answering. And that's why we, we wanted to try it on, on a natural language data set. So we looked at um, a data set called TRIP, which targets common sense reasoning about intuitive physics. And it kind of fit what we were looking for because it was created to evaluate uh, this kind of reasoning process of models beyond just end task performance. And the idea in TRIP is you have these plausible and implausible stories. Um, and then there's three tasks you have to uh, perform. The first one is the plausibility task, which is sort of the end task. You have to say which of these stories is more plausible. In this case, it's story A and story B. Yeah, why is story B not plausible? That's the consistency uh, task where you have to identify the reason story B isn't plausible. And the reason is because there are two conflicting sentences. Each story has uh, a pair of conflicting sentences. Here it's sentences two and five. And unplug the telephone, and then she heard the telephone ring. So yeah, the telephone shouldn't have rang if it was uh, unplugged. Uh, so that's consistency is, is the percentage of correctly identified implausible stories that also um, identify the correct conflicting senses. The final task is verifiability, which is the, kind of the hardest task. Here you have to identify both uh, plausibility and consistency, as well as all the relevant physical states. And by physical states, the meaning is um, propositional information related to the conflicting senses. So here we're looking at senses two and five and looking at preconditions and postconditions uh, in those senses. So here are the Precondition is the telephone uh, was powered. The postcondition is the telephone wasn't powered because it's unplugged, and etc. For sentence five, so there's some set of propositions that need to be uh, predicted. So to convert trip to breakpoint format was uh, relatively straightforward. So we for the plausibility task we simply concatenate the string representation of both stories and then uh, use a special uh, token to elicit the sort of, sort of prompt the model to output either A or B. Um, and similarly for the consistency task, we um, provide the model sort of with these uh, sentence numbering, the sentence numbers, and then again, ask the model to uh, output the correct uh, conflicting senses. Oh, here should be one, so that's a mistake on the slide. But um, yeah, so just asking for this string representation of the conflicting sentences. And on the verifiability task, this is really the sort of proposition prediction the breakpoint transformer is doing. Um, and here we simply have a set of propositions that we need the model to predict with the only sort of uh, modification we needed to do is handle these um, 
uh, preconditions and post conditions. So uh, here, for example, we needed to be able to represent the telephone was powered in the beginning and then it wasn't powered at the end of the sentence too. And the way we did this was simply by um, using past tense and present tense. I actually didn't think that such a simple <laughs> method would work, but it, it actually worked pretty well. So that's the way we handle preconditions and post conditions. Um, and yeah, and that's then we could transfer all these tasks to our uh, breakpoint format. We compared ourselves to uh, the baseline from the trip paper, which is uh, based on Roberta. Uh, this, this was a model that's pretty highly tailored to the trip task. So they had some like special classifiers for preconditions, for effects, uh, conflict detection. So the whole thing was like pretty much hardwired for the, the trip task. So adding, you know, changing the structure of the task would have made, uh, you need to change the model pretty consider considerably. Whereas in our model, we kind of could plug and play the existing architecture. In terms of results, we also got uh, uh, good results here, even on the sort of hardest task, which was the verification task. Um, we see even like you know three times better than the, the uh, baseline. Um, and yeah, so this was encouraging, I think, to kind of to summarize what we saw in these breakpoints, um, that we could, one, add them as sort of a, a modular plugin to existing models. So you can kind of add this kind of breakpoint modeling uh, ability without harming original QA performance. You do need the right annotations to do this, right? It's not like it's learning those uh, breakpoints in an unsupervised way. Uh, second, we saw that breakpoints inherit similar systematic generalization limitations of, of large language models. So encoding intermediate state information in this way did not markedly approve uh, generalization, as we saw in the Babby tasks. But finally, we saw that the trip results uh, they do demonstrate some kind of improved alignment between sort of the end task prediction, um, sort of the plausibility task that I showed you earlier, with the sort of intermediate outputs, which are those propositions that are predicted. So there is some alignment between the end task, between like the generated outputs with the propositions, but I think there's an important caveat uh, that we still uh, need to handle, which is this kind of causal relation between breakpoint the information represented in breakpoints and the generated model outputs, right? Because the model can generate answers to questions that are in contradiction with what's inside the breakpoint. So it's not really breakpoints. It's uh, kind of, I guess you can call it a inspired by breakpoints, and it's some indication of intermediate model beliefs, but there's still work to actually make these uh, representations really causally impingent on the, the model outputs. And that's kind of an outstanding question, I think, for in a lot of other NLP uh, tasks as well. Cool. So that's this. That's the end of the first part. That's the NLP uh, sort of uh, work that was sort of the main part of my PhD. Uh, so yeah. Again, feel free to answer, ask questions if you got any. <clears throat> cool. Yeah. So so this is kind of changing gears um, because yeah, this is <laughs> the backstory for this is I think toward the end of my PhD, I think a lot of things started happening. Um, yeah, misinformation, global pandemics, and it was. Starting to see a lot of things in sort of the information environments and, and social media and things like that. And I was sort of uh, looking for ways where, where some of these, uh, yeah, some of my research could, could help be applied to, to these settings. Um, and, it, and it became, yeah, something really interesting that I'm, I'm sort of interested in continuing uh, uh, onwards. So, yeah, this is called AI uh, Environments for AI Augmented Sense Making. Um, and yeah, I think. Kind of in a nutshell, it's moving from annotation environments to sense making environments, where by sense making, I mean processes by which individuals and groups organize and structure information to improve subsequent decision making and action, actions. Uh, the idea here is that we also annotate uh, to make sense of new information. So, uh, looking kind of at these old school textbooks, you know, people annotate text, highlight it for their own benefit, uh, not just the annotations that I talked about earlier, which were sort of, um, yeah, annotations. The annotations I talked about earlier were kind of, you know, paying mechanical turkers or someone to do annotations, which were then used to train some model. Uh, there was no kind of return leg where the annotations actually benefited the people making the annotations. Here, I'm kind of interested in a setting where uh, people are, are making annotations that are coming back to them in like a feedback loop and benefiting them in some way. So uh, I call that a sense making environment. It's some kind of interface where you're actually writing annotations and, re and reading in return some kind of data that's, that's shaped off your annotations. And I think the first sort of exposure I had to this was uh, work with uh, Tom Hope in, the, uh, in my PhD, where I, I helped him build a, uh, a creative search engine. So the way it worked here was 
people had to annotate product descriptions uh, with purposes and mechanisms. So some spans of text were purposes and some were mechanisms. Uh, for example, a purpose is, you know, support your neck, uh, track your sleep, and then a mechanism is uh, soft material or neck pillow. And we collected these kind of annotated training sentences and used it to train a model that was essentially doing this kind of annotation. So uh, trained a tagging model. Uh, we used graph uh, convolutional networks at the time with the CRF loss for tagging. And then we could use this, um, these annotations. We annotated a, a whole corpus of the, the full corpus of, of product descriptions. And we could use it then to power this kind of query search where you can specify a purpose and a mechanism. So for example, here, wash clothes, but without using water. And then the model can uh, provide you kind of relevant uh, documents. This is kind of small, but yeah, for example, a waterless washing machine that scrubs clothes, clothes clean with dry ice. So then you can kind of surface these kind of things based on the on the purpose and mechanism you specify. Uh, so this was kind of a preliminary sort of exploration of you know, annotations that are coming back to, to help people uh, navigate information. Uh, and later on, this is the sort of collective sense-making part. Um, this is kind of the setting that I'm, that I'm also currently interested in, is helping people navigate information overload and find interesting personalized content in, in this ocean you know, of, of information. And I think the solution, a really interesting solution you know, that a lot of uh, apps are, are taking is letting people annotate interesting content and people, right? You have content, you're annotating it using likes and retweets, you're annotating people using follow. Um, and the classic example here is, is uh, Twitter. So yeah, Twitter is this kind of AI augmented sense-making environment. Uh, people are providing these annotations and then they're getting personalized content and Twitter works uh, uh, pretty well, right? I mean, a lot of us use it, I imagine. I would do a show of hands if I was in person, but I'm imagining like a lot of you are on Twitter. Um, but the problem with things like Twitter, there are a few problems. I think that we're seeing a lot of them, especially I think recently, there is the problem of opacity where you know the data is actually enclosed inside this environment. There's no oversight or alternatives to the platform algorithms. Uh, and, and you know Twitter can decide to cut off free data access. And this is something that just from like two weeks ago that's causing a lot of panic among scientists because uh, yeah, a lot of research projects suddenly need to be closed because Twitter decided they want to uh, charge money for it. Uh, the second problem is centralization. Uh, these platforms control our attention because they're controlling the model that's uh, you know making the feed algorithm. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of again recent uh, things that you know may be harmful for Tesla, and then they suddenly kind of disappear from search results or from the feed uh, because Twitter can do that. And finally, there's these misaligned incentives where. Twitter is not optimizing for engagement. It's optimizing for uh, Twitter is not optimizing for education or knowledge. It's optimizing for engagement. Right? There's this kind of attention marketplace here that's going on the side, where Twitter just wants you to be on the platform so they can sell your data to uh, you know advertisers. Um, so yeah, when people think about this, oftentimes uh, the question is like, can't we just decentralize social media? And then you know, there's things like Mastodon or decentralized social networks. Uh, and, and these kind of have been tried, but with limited success. And the, we, we had, this is a position paper we wrote about this, like a blue sky idea paper. Um, we talk about this idea of free speech versus free attention, where decentralized social media is focused on freeing speech, but the free, real fight is for attention. And this point has also been made by, by others. Um, Amy Zhang is uh, someone that also has been really inspirational for, for this research. Um, so yeah, Facebook likes to say that they give the power uh, to share anything with anyone, but that's kind of useless if you know, they control who sees what. So uh, we kind of highlighted annotations as this attention economy goal. This is what the platforms are actually sort of hoarding. Uh, platforms control our attention because they control our annotations, and these annotations are kind of the digital traces of human attention. So if you wanted to build uh, an alternative feed, you would really need, this is the kind of data you would actually really need. So this is. This is kind of hinting why these, why these annotations are so valuable. This is what they use to power the feed algorithm. Annotations here can be things that are explicit, like reactions or retweets, uh, as well as like implicit information people are making without even thinking about it, like clicking on tweets and you know, the kind of viewership data. So yeah, our current model is these centralized platforms. What we proposed in this uh, Blue Sky paper was actually just to decentralize the whole stack. Uh, because you, you look at these three parts, the sense-making environment, which is like the interface and the data and the model, uh, and all these three parts, you can actually, um, you can actually decentralize them. Um, in terms of sense-making environments, there are already things like browser extensions, such as uh, Thready, which is some work in Semantic Scholar, 
as well as uh, this example here from a, a thing called Memex, you have these you know, extensions, the sidebar that lets you annotate a paper. Um, and then you can control these annotations essentially by just storing them in some kind of self-sovereign storage. If people have heard about uh, solid data pods, that's kind of a, a popular, I think, uh, this is kind of new technology from the sort of distributed storage uh, technology. It's not, not necessarily blockchain, but just giving people sort of this personal Amazon cloud. Uh, so you can store this kind of data, then you can share it, um, and you can control what you share, and this allows you sort of to build alternative recommendation feeds. We said that's the reason like Twitter currently can build a uh, sort of uh, mon monopoly on, on recommendations because they have this data. Uh, but yeah, then you could imagine alternative recommendation feeds, and you have this kind of uh, decoupling of app and data layer, which is something that is really useful if you want to have a plur like plurality of recommendation feeds instead of being stuck with only one. So yeah, that is uh, just a nutshell. The reason I'm, I'm talking about this here is because um, it's kind of an inspiration for some of the research directions I'm thinking about at Semantic Scholar. Uh, so yeah, I'll kind of move on to those and, and hopefully things will uh, connect. So yeah, this is the last part of the talk. Just in the last few minutes, I'll talk about some um, ideas that, um, I have for uh, Semantic Scholar, AI augmented collective sense making. And I think the main sort of um, insight from this kind of Twitter story for me was that sense making is really social and we don't just care about recommendations, but we actually really care also about uh, who recommended content and what they thought of it, as well as being able to share um, appreciation for recommendations. So it's embedded in this whole social context. And uh, I think I've come to think of Twitter as some kind of recommendation recommendation system. What I mean by that is that Twitter is recommending us tweets, but it's actually a lot of the time it's recommending us recommendations for other content, right? So here we have, you know, people recommending papers and Twitter is recommending us those recommendations. So it's not directly recommending this active inference book, it's actually recommending me someone that's recommending it. And this is why it makes it very compelling because I might you know, follow this person and think he's like really knowledgeable or whatever. So that kind of leads to the first sort of idea, which is uh, shared libraries on Semantic Scholar. And this is kind of a, think of it as open scholarly Goodreads. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Goodreads, it's kind of this uh, book review uh, platform. And the idea here is to provide researchers with an interface for social sharing of uh, reading status, reactions, review of papers, essentially yeah, providing them with a new annotation interface. Um, you can also connect it to something like Mastodon and, and you know, get some of this more uh, social functionality. So uh, you know, people might mark stuff they want to read, they might you know, mark some kind of uh, minimal review of it or write some content about it. Um, and once you have this kind of data, you can also embed it sort of in the landing pages of papers uh, people could see sort of what their uh, peer network uh, thought about a paper or, you know, if it's being read by whoever it's been read by. Um, and beyond that, you can do a lot of interesting things, I think, with these kind of shared library data. Uh, it could help with, like, improved altmetrics, so you could uh, measure research impact. It's kind of another data source you could use for, for gauging the kind of effects of papers. Uh, you could use it for social matching, right, because uh, you can find people with similar interests. Here, I think Lex Friedman, I heard him on a podcast say once that Goodreads could have been like the best dating app if the data were open. Uh, and this is you know, a way to do this in, in research, like among dating for researchers. Um, and finally, you can use this kind of data to power a new uh, social recommendations modality. I'll talk about that in this next slide. Um, and this can kind of complement the current uh, recommended papers feed. So currently kind of uh, there is some sort of author aware recommendation where it'll tell you uh, you know, this paper is being recommended to you because there's some uh, author here that you cited often, right? Um, but another thing you could add is another kind of relevance indication is, you know, this paper is also uh, recommended or was enjoyed by, you know, X researchers in your network. So you could add this kind of uh, further relevance information as well as kind of um, be able to power recommendations based on that data. Uh, another thing I think that would be interesting to experiment with is incorporating uh, social incentives. So being able to you know, these things we see on, on uh, social media, people like to back propagate credit. So they hack tip to the source of the recommendation here. Oren is uh, hat tipping Dan Weld uh, for this recommendation of a paper. And then Oren himself can also get social feedback for his recommendation. So both of these things I think are something that people, they make, you know, these kind of compelling the recommendations and get engaging for people. A way to sort of get started, I think, with this kind of, so, so a big problem with any kind of recommendation engine is cold start problem where you don't have enough data to make quality recommendations. Uh, but because a lot of this data already exists on social media, you can kind of uh, 
you know, text mine it with uh, existing NLP systems, um, as well as sort of provide people with ways to integrate uh, the reference managers they're using, like Zotero or Rome Research, and uh, draw, you know, import reference lists to uh, this library. And finally, uh, this is an idea related to Semantic uh, Reader. So currently, like Semantic Reader is this, uh, I think, a really interesting sort of experiment in trying to present people with a richer reading experience for, for papers. Um, it'd be interesting to sort of incorporate this with a writing interface as well, where uh, you could actually add, add people add more, uh, you know, expressive and share annotations, essentially. Like the, I think I talked in the first section here about sharing reviews on, on books or on papers. You can actually ask people to share sort of annotations, highlights of text, uh, connect them with other pieces of uh, text and other documents, um, and you know, kind of participate in constructing shared knowledge graphs. Uh, probably many of you are familiar with uh, discourse graphs by uh, uh, Joel Chan. It has this kind of ontology of questions, claims, statements, and context, and this is kind of a, it gives a nice you know annotation ontology, a simple annotation ontology that's very expressive and useful. If you add, allow people to start you know, connecting. Okay, this paper answers a certain question I had, or it makes a statement that I think supports some other claim, et cetera. Uh, then using this kind of data, again, you can use a, a model to, to start um, you know, learning to make these uh, link predictions um, using humans in the loop to verify predictions. So you can kind of get a new, a new kind of model uh, that could be useful for literature discovery. So yeah, to summarize, um, I think this is kind of the question that often occupies me as I approach uh, these modeling problems. Where is this sort of transformative environment data model pathway? Uh, and here I suggested these kind of annotation interfaces for libraries on Semantic Scholar or the Semantic Reader Writer um, yeah, as data, and then using them to drive new uh, social recommendations modality or discourse graphs. And yeah, that's just kind of a few ideas. I'm happy to discuss them more because I think that's, yeah, making better sense of science together yeah, with using these kind of models. Uh, and yeah, that's it. So. Thank you, and yeah, thanks. This is a chance to thank the many uh, people that were involved in all these different uh, projects, uh, as well as a lot of people here at AI2. And happy to take any questions. Thanks, Renan. Uh, we have time for questions. I have a question. Uh, thanks for the talk. Do, do you have a sense of how to motivate people to use these features? I think for Goodreads, it's kind of easy to just write a review of a novel, but often technical papers, reviewing them is actually challenging and something we feel is part of our social obligation to the community, and it's really hard. So I, it's hard to imagine folks just kind of for fun reviewing a paper at, in addition to all the other responsibilities they have. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think here that we're not aiming for like in-depth reviews that you would, you know, put an open review necessary. Like this is actually this wouldn't be the sort of the review of a paper. Rather, thinking of it more as like a pre, like like a pre-print, so you'd have like pre-peer review. And this is kind of people are doing this already, right? You can already see this on social media. I think that's like as good a, of an example as any because uh, you know here people are you know reviewing something. It's well written, full of insights. Here's my summary. This is already some kind of review, right? Even even just the information. Um, there's actually literature on this that like even just the information that someone marked something to read or that they marked it that they read it and that they didn't rate it. Like all this stuff is like information that is actually uh, relevant and it's useful. Joel Chan calls this like uh, you know exhaust creative exhaust. It's like the exhaust that doesn't get collected anywhere. It's just like uh, like you could actually collect this data and, and you know use it. So I'm, I'm thinking about those kind of reviews, that, that granularity, and not sort of in-depth, uh, you know, writing a whole uh, thing for free, just to, yeah, reviewing something out of the blue. OK, thanks. I guess, I guess related to that, um, you said that you, th you think that you know, these attempts to decentralize Twitter have been unsuccessful. And if people are already sharing this information on Twitter, what would make them um, want to use a different platform? Um, yeah, that's, this is kind of, I think, um, where, right, this is, I think, I think, A, we're not alone. I think there's, like, I just saw it today, like, a, a paper in Nature about, like, how to move scientists from Twitter to Mastodon or something. But I think presenting some of these, like, maybe Semantic Scholar can, you know, we can really help with that if, if like, we're, we're providing some kind of thing that you can't do on Twitter, right? Like, if you can't connect your Zotero to some, uh, you know, social media feed, like, uh, you know, uh, Mastodon, then that would be something that would 
help people sort of move. If they saw that it's sort of in interesting information being shared elsewhere, uh, that could be a way to help people move off. As well as I think also a lot of people, like if people want to be on Twitter, I think it's, um, yeah, someone has told me like, you know, you meet people where they are and, and sort of you allow people to, this is where do I have that, um, yeah, here. Just like I think this is, you think like, I think of it as like integration. So you'd have people, you know, share on Twitter, but also share to something that's open and not just like a platform. So you would sort of just build these integrations to sort of let people stay where they are, but also share it to the other place where it can like provide more useful functionality. Thanks. I was also wondering about um, you. You were suggesting that we, you know, the first part of the talk, you talked about models, and then um, basically gave an example of being able to predict background pur purpose methods, sort of information. Yeah. Um, uh, did, I, I, I was, but then you, but then in this later part, you were you were envisioning that people are going to be making annotations, and then those annotations can be used to train models. Um, how how do you sort of see it, see um, starting the, that bootstrapping process, um, like, like, um, like is, is the the background purpose model could that be used as a bootstrapping model, or or I guess you were suggesting later on that people would be annotating, uh, providing different kinds of annotations on papers, but but why would they want to provide those before there's a model? Um, well, yeah, I think again, people, yeah, I, have, I mean, there's examples. People do this on Twitter as well, right? People annotate papers. Like, they actually highlight pieces of text and they talk about them already today just because they want to say something about it in the social context. So, again, I think people already do it. So, even just like letting someone sort of giving someone the option to say something about it on Twitter, but also share it, you know, to this new, to some new interface, uh, that's already kind of one, one sort of viable way to, to start. But then, yeah, and I think, you know, providing people with more, uh, like building it as a part of it. So I don't have a slide for this actually, but I don't know if you guys are familiar with, uh, there are people that what they do nowadays, they, there's actually like social annotation. Uh, uh, let me see where, I, I might actually have this. Um, yeah, people do actually, people people annotate stuff and then they train GPT or don't train it, train GPT, but they sort of, there's you know ways to sort of index your sort of personal knowledge base with GPT. So people actually already uh, are kind of getting used to this idea of, annotating things with the sort of thought that that would help later, even for their own personal sort of use case, uh, um, be able to sort of, yeah, serve as input for, for you know, some kind of language model that would then uh, help them retrieve relevant documents or summarize relevant stuff. So, and those are using like zero training because it's just using things, something like GPT, which is, uh, you know, GPT index, which is, you know, uh, just like a big pre-trained model. So you could actually think of giving people value even for like, without training any new model and then sort of, by them donating, giving more data, then you're just, you know, then you're, you'll be able to sort of fine tune in interesting ways. Uh, so that's maybe one way to think about it too. Try to find that uh, link meanwhile. There's <laughs> it was something I saw recently and it was pretty interesting, like how people are building their own personal knowledge bases with GPT. But yeah, if you have any other questions also. Can you say a little more about this framing of uh, decentralized sense making? So when I think about sense making, I feel like a lot of times people are doing things in isolation, and it's hard for others to benefit from like my own personal like research process or the outcome of it. Um, I know you have like annotation. Maybe the, these are like judgments or like um, notes people are taking about a paper being shared across um, other researchers. I'm just wondering, like, what is, like, the high-level takeaway for, for this idea? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's actually a slide I, I, I didn't add in the end. I thought maybe it was getting, like, too much into the weeds. But I think one, one sort of sort of glue that holds something like this together is the idea of, like, uh, interoperable data schema. So you have, like, uh, yeah, I think it's like figuring out what are the sort of each of these, these are different apps, right? Like it's a sense making environment, like an extension like this or uh, a content discovery. They're all like different apps and they need some way to communicate with each other. And there's a lot of interesting work on these, uh, on, on data schema. There's, I don't know if you're familiar with schema.org, 
So it'll have like a, a review schema or a, you know like schema. So essentially, there's a lot of these things already exist, like the structured data, uh, a schema representation that then then can kind of be shared across different apps. So um, yeah, so so you yourself maybe make a lot of notes, but uh, we might not want to share all those notes, and you probably don't want to share all those notes. But I think sort of agreeing on sort of minimal minimum viable thing that uh, is sort of useful across a bunch of different apps. And you know, for example, this is why I sort of focused on uh, on uh, on reading reading lists because this is something that's like very common across all these different apps. Like this kind of information is like uh, super basic. So yeah, you know, you could you could represent it in Notion or in Rome or in like in, in so many of these different uh, uh, reading apps. And then uh, so that's kind of maybe a place to start if you can sort of uh, be able to, or you could just get people to you know add this kind of information directly in uh, Semantic Scholar to their libraries. Uh, but yeah, the, the idea here is. Being able to share this data by the use of these interoperable data schemas. So, and then figuring out what the schemas to start with, like because yeah, there's a lot of different data types, and, and you have to kind of note which to focus on that's most relevant. And the one I'm kind of uh, uh, focusing on here is these reading lists. So you can imagine, like in your own reference manager, like how much of your reference manager would you agree to sort of share information from? That's kind of a you know, question that would be interesting to hear. Like. How much would you willing to even say I read this or I didn't read this or I want to read this? Like even that kind of information is already something. Uh, there's a signal once you know you get lots of people doing this at scale. I see. Thanks. I'm so I'm still trying to under, understand the connection between the some of the first part of the talk and then the, the later part of the talk. It seemed like the first part of the talk you were sort of saying that they're not realistic tasks that people actually care about, um, and is is there a deeper connection between the first and the second? Like, do you think that uh, the tasks that you're proposing in the second part or the last part of the talk um, could help inform better progress on NLP in NLP on tasks that are meaningful? Or how, how would you um, sort of unify or the, the parts? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, going back to this sort of, uh, Right. So a lot of the first part of my PhD was was still looking at these kind of environments, but yeah, the questions I was asking were more related to sort of yeah, uh, NLP research, like more pure NLP research, like what are the limitations of models, uh, things like that, or how to annotate some kind of uh, new data set for for a particular application. Um, but yeah, the same sort of motivation was yeah, can we find? Oftentimes, then the sort of yeah the 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 data we wanted doesn't really exist. So you look for the environment that would sort of allow you to collect the interesting interactions, that would allow you to train the model you're interested in. And I think here it's sort of the same same idea, but really looking at models that might be um, kind of meet people where they are and like more broadly applicable to problems people have today, which is like uh, navigating information overload, knowing what paper to read. Um, and then some of these maybe discourse graph models, sort of yeah, drawing connections between papers in ways that are uh, quite difficult to do today. Uh, so yeah, so I think like you say, it's kind of uh, taking sort of the, the basic principle of these, you know, what, what in interesting environments can we build and then trying to, uh, yeah, and, and trying to follow through on, you know, collecting that data and, and, and training these models and getting that, uh, and then getting that feedback loop for actually getting people part of the annotation. Um, and then you can really sort of, I think, uh, take off with in terms of scale and, and, you know, make something that's really useful for people. Um, and also, you know, I, again, like this is kind of disclaimer, but, uh, uh, a lot of this is also sort of my the start of my PhD again. It was kind of then there was the pandemic and a lot of things happened and I and I kind of felt like the sort of collective sense making is is really important to me. So if it looks a little bit like I'm just looking for a way to apply collective sense making ideas, it's it's kind of that I'm you know I am interested in in, in sort of bringing what I learned in the start of my PhD to this uh, area of collective sense making. Got it. Thanks. But I, and I do think like again with that said, I think there's also uh, there are definitely, I see like there's, I think these environments are, are definitely like a connecting thread. So, yeah. Great. Um, well, I, I guess we're out of time. Um, so if there's no other urgent questions, let's uh, thank Ronan again.